Hey, what's going on AP peeps? We, we have the A Push Review Final Exam Edition Part 2. So I'm going to cover everything you need to know from reconstruction up to and including present day. So hopefully you've watched the first part, which goes from colonial America to the Civil War. If not, check the link in the description below to watch that first and then watch this. And hopefully I will cover most of the things that will appear, at least in the multiple choice portion of your exam. So let's get going. All right, we're going to start talking about Reconstruction and what is it exactly. It's the rebuilding of the nation after the Civil War. Now, there's two groups that are vying for power in Reconstruction. We have the presidents, uh, led initially by Lincoln, but mostly by Andrew Johnson and Congress, led by the radical Republicans. Now, the presidential Reconstruction was much more lenient. Both Lincoln and Johnson called for 10% loyalty oaths, meaning that 10% of Southerners who who voted in the 1860 election had to pledge their allegiance to the Union, and they had to adopt the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery. Radical Reconstruction was much more harsh and divided the South into five different zones, which were controlled by the military. Some amendments that you need to know, the 13th Amendment just mentioned, made slavery illegal. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship to blacks and also pr provided for equal protection for citizens. And this amendment will come into play a lot more in the 20th century. And former Confederate officers could not hold state or federal office. And the 15th Amendment granted suffrage for blacks, but it's still only for males. So women still are not allowed to vote. Um, but the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are known as the Reconstruction Amendments, so definitely know those, please. And the South was able to get around the 15th Amendment by finding loopholes such as poll taxes, literacy tests, etc. as ways to keep African American males from voting. And the KKK was also used as well. Some terms that you should be familiar with, scalawags are southerners that lived in the south and favored reconstruction. Do not confuse them with carpetbaggers who came from the north, which we'll talk about in just a second. If you're having trouble remembering, scalawag starts with an S and so does southerners. Carpetbaggers were individuals who moved from the north to the south during Reconstruction, usually to make money. And examples of carpetbaggers were teachers and doctors, etc. Now, the KKK is a terrorist organization that develops during Reconstruction as a way to intimidate African Americans and keep them from voting. They also went after carpetbaggers and scalawags in the south, as you can tell from this political cartoon. The federal government passes the Force Acts, which are passed in response to the KKK, and federal troops could be used to quell the KKK or try to attempt to stop their terrorist actions. All right, black codes are set up during Reconstruction, and these regulated the affairs of African Americans and tried to make conditions very similar to slavery. African Americans could be arrested for being unemployed under black codes. Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's vice president, he was from the South, and he was added to the ticket to balance out the ticket. He is impeached, and remember, impeachment does not mean you are removed from office. It simply means that charges are brought against you. He was disliked by radical Republicans, and he was impeached for firing this guy, Secretary of War Stanton. Now, the Radical Republicans passed this law, the Tenure of Office Act, for the sole purpose of knowing that Johnson would fire Stanton, and then they were able to impeach him for breaking a law. During impeachment, it goes to the Senate for them to vote, and they fall one vote shy of conviction. So Andrew Johnson is not removed from office. What ended Reconstruction? Absolutely, positively must know this. It's the Compromise of 1877, and this settles the presidential election of 1876 between Republican Hayes and Democrat Tilden. And the Compromise settled this dispute, and R Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president, even though he did not receive a majority of popular votes. It's actually a commission was set up to settle this dispute and Hayes was granted the presidency. Now in return, this is why it's so important in the little compromise of 1877, military rule in the South is over. So if you are ever asked what ended Reconstruction, what marked the end of Reconstruction, what event was the end of Reconstruction, it's either going to be the Compromise of 1877 or the military withdraws from the South. Definitely know that. And also a Southerner had to be appointed to Hayes's cabinet as well. All right, the next topic, the, the next era that we will get into is the Gilded Age. And this is a term coined by Mark Twain, who wrote a book called The Gilded Age. And the idea of this is that all, although things look great on the outside, on the surface, there are many societal issues. And there's a huge gap between the rich and the poor. So let's talk about business during the Gilded Age. You have the growth of monopolies. You have Carnegie Steel, Rockefeller Oil, Mo, J.P. Morgan and his banking industry, Vanderbilt and railroads. Two terms that you should know are vertical integration and horizontal integration. 
And vertical integration is owning all aspects of a business from beginning to end. So Carnegie Steel, everything that went into making the steel and touched the steel was owned by Carnegie. He did not buy anything from other businesses. He owned everything from beginning of production to the end. That is called vertical integration and that is legal. Horizontal integration is owning all businesses in an industry. That's what we think of as a monopoly today. So if I own my ice cream if I own my own ice cream shop and suddenly in Buffalo, New York I start buying up every other ice cream shop there is, that would be an example of horizontal integration and that would be illegal. However, if I own my own farm and I get milk and eggs from my farm and I grow my own sugar on this farm, that would be an example of vertical integration because I'm getting all the materials and resources from my own business. That is fine. That is legal. How did rich, wealthy individuals like Carnegie and Rockefeller justify their wealth? Um, one of the things they used was this term social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest, that the rich are rich because they are the strongest and they're entitled to it. But just as important and something that does appear quite often is the Gospel of Wealth, which is a book by Andrew Carnegie. And he would argue that wealthy individuals owe it to society to spread their money around. And, and Carnegie did this himself by setting aside lots of money for libraries and schools, etc. President Grant has a couple scandals during the Gilded Age, and there is President Grant. He is associated with the Credit Mobilier and the Whiskey Ring. And each of these scandals uh, had some of his people in his administration who did shady businesses and he he was kind of tarred from this dealing and the same thing will happen with warren g harding in the 1920s boss tweed can't really talk about the gilded age without talking about boss tweed he was the leader of tammany hall in new york city and by the way should have mentioned this earlier i have pretty much videos on every single topic here so if you want more detail on anything just go to youtube pin my name adam norris and type in boss tweed for example and a video will come up on boss tweed and tammany hall so almost anything in this PowerPoint that you want more info on, just search my name in that title and you'll find a video for it. And Boss Tweed stole over $200 million from New York City. And he was later caught in part, he, he actually fled the country, and he was caught in part because people recognized him from Thomas Nast political cartoons. And here's a political cartoon by Thomas Nast, and uh, you can see Boss Tweed here, and he has a money bag for head because he all he really cared about was money. The Pendleton Act is passed in 1883 and this is passed in response to the assassination of James Garfield. James Garfield is assassinated in 1881 and the man who killed him did so because he believed that Chester A. Arthur who was Garfield's vice president would give him a job. He was in favor of patronage Chester A. Arthur and this guy who killed him but James Garfield was against it. So he is assassinated, and now the government passes the Pendleton Act, which requires individuals to pass a test before getting government jobs. So this patronage is a lot more difficult after the Pendleton Act. All right, we're going to spend some time talking about unions during the Gilded Age. Know the Knights of Labor that, and know that they allowed skilled and unskilled workers and that the AFL only allowed skilled workers only. This has been a question quite frequently. Definitely know the AFL is skilled workers only. The Knights of Labor are skilled and unskilled. Samuel Gompers was the leader of the AFL, and he championed for an eight-hour workday and collective bargaining. He also was known as fighting for bread and butter issues, things like a higher wage, fewer hours, better working conditions. And on the right is Samuel Gompers meeting with Senator La Robert LaFollette from Wisconsin. We'll talk about him a little bit when we get to the progressive era. Immigrants were hard to unionize. Many unions did not like immigrants because they would work for lower wages and it was harder for them to unionize because there was a language barrier. And oftentimes immigrants were used to as, as strike breakers or what is known as scab. So these were when unions would go on strike, immigrants would come in and work in replacement for them. Strikes during the Gilded Age that you should know, when in doubt, strikes occurred because of wage cuts. So if you ask, if you're asked the question about why did this strike happen, chances are it's because wages were cut. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the government almost always sided with the owners. Very, very rarely did they side with the unions. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 was started because of railroad cuts. Homestead Strike of 1892 is another major one, as is the Pullman Strike of 1894. You should definitely know the Haymarket Square Riot of 1886. 
And this turned violent, and um, an anarchist, somebody in the crowd throws a stick of dynamite, it blows up, kills a couple people, and injures many more. And the Knights of Labor were unfairly associated with the Haymarket Square riot. They really had nothing to do with the, the stick of dynamite at all, but they were blamed for it. And that led to the demise of the Knights of Labor. That and the fact that they allowed skilled and unskilled. Definitely know that. Some laws that you should know during the Gilded Age, the Interstate Commerce Act of 1877 created the Interstate Commerce Commission. And this was meant to regulate the railroad industry. And this was an attempt to appease farmers who were upset with railroads. This was not very effective early on, but it gets a little more teeth later on. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Holy cow, know this. The purpose of this was to break up monopolies. And this has been a past AP question. The purpose of the Sherman Antitrust Act was to break up monopolies. But in practice, this was actually used to break up unions. So definitely know that. Even though it was meant to break up monopolies, some lawyers were able to use the wording against unions, and it was used to break up unions. All right, we're going to talk about the West and westward expansion. It really dates back to the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 and continues throughout the 1840s and 50s with the idea of manifest destiny, but that many people begin to move in large numbers after the Civil War. And the government helped encourage westward expansion by several different ways. In the Homestead Act of 1862, they provided 160 acres, I should say, to settlers. And this was for a very, very low fee, sometimes even free, if they could, if they promised to live on the land for five years and improve it. The transcontinent, the transcontinental railroad helped encourage westward expansion, and this was completed in 1869. And the government helped by subsidizing the railroad companies through loans and free land for them to build the railroads. As Americans moved further west, they encroached on Native American land and Buffalo be almost became extinct. And this was a huge problem because Native Americans lived off of hunting Buffalo. Helen Hunt Jackson, definitely know this woman. She wrote a book called A Century of Dishonor, which was about the plight of natives at the hands of the U.S. government. Basically, it depicts the interaction of the U.S. government with the Native Americans and how the U.S. government often broke treaties and Native Americans were hurt by this. The Dawes Act, holy cow, no, the Dawes Act of 1887. The purpose of this was to assimilate Native Americans. And if you look at this picture, you can see that these Native Americans are dressed in quote unquote American clothing. They have suits on, they have dresses, and it's encouraged for these Native Americans to become quote unquote more American. That word assimilate, definitely know that. And children of Native Americans were sent to boarding schools and natives were converted to Christianity. This attempts to completely change the way that Native Americans live. It also gives them 160 acres of land, heads of family, for them to live on. So it's a movement away from hunting and gathering and making Native Americans become farmers. In response to Dawes Act and other things, Native Americans practice the ghost dance. The ghost dance, which is a ritual that envisioned the return of buffalo and the removal of whites from their lands. They did this because they were upset that they did not have, that their freedoms were being taken away. And this leads to the Wounded Knee Massacre, in which hundreds of natives were killed by the United States Army. The U.S. Army was ordered to stop the ghost dance. In 1890, we have an important census, and this states that the frontier line no longer exists. And essentially, all land has been settled. And Frederick Jackson Turner wrote a very famous book in 1893 called The Frontier Thesis. And he argues that the frontier helped promote an American identity and that the frontier really helped make American democratic. Definitely know these two books on this page, the authors and the purpose of their books, Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis and A Century of Dishonor by Helen Hunt Jackson. You very well may see them. All right, populism, we're going to stay in the late 1800s, and we're going to talk about the Grange. And this was a group made up of farmers, and the purpose of the Grange was to provide social and economic opportunities for farmers. They sought to end things like monopolies and railroads, and they wanted the government to own certain industries and certain businesses. This kind of develops into the populist party. And they absorb some of the ideas from the farmers. And they have, in 1892, the Omaha Platform, which is written by this guy, Ignatius Donnelly. Definitely know the Omaha Platform. This will be significant in the progressive era, which we'll talk about next. So the Omaha Platform consisted of several demands, including the free and unlimited coinage of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1. What that means is for every one ounce of gold in circulation to back up money, Back then, the money was on the was backed by the gold standard. For every one ounce of gold, 16 ounces of silver 
equity equal one ounce of gold. That would increase the money supply and help out debtors and farmers pay back loans. They also wanted a graduated income tax, which means the more money that you make, the more that you pay in taxes. They wanted the government to own telephones and telegraph lines, as well as railroads. They favored the initiative referendum and recall three progressive era reforms. The initiative is citizens can propose a law. A referendum is citizens can vote on a law. And a recall is you can remove an elected official. And they also favored a postal savings bank run by the government and the direct election of senators. Out of all of these proposed issues, graduate income tax becomes the 16th Amendment. Initiative referendum and recall happens on state levels, especially in Wisconsin, and the direct election of senators is the 17th Amendment. So the populist party, their ideas definitely are absorbed by America later on. In 1893, we have a panic, and when in doubt when we're talking about causes, always think over speculation. Whether it is over speculation on land or stocks, chances are that is the cause of a panic. And this was a really, really bad panic in 1893. It's caused by over speculation, stock market crash, and overproduction. It's very, very similar to the stock market crash of 1929. So some results of this, the government repeals the Sherman Silver Act. Coxie's Army is an organization that is organized in response to the panic of 1893 and this was a group that went to marching went to washington and they advocated a public works program or government works program and he marched a group of unemployed individuals to washington and it was broken up by the police this is very similar to the bonus army which we'll talk about and both of those are often tested on the ap exam so definitely know coxie's army and the bonus army both of them marched on washington to demand some sort of economic relief Free silver, again, I talked about, is having silver back the value of the dollar at a ratio of 16 to 1. 16 ounces of silver would equal 1 ounce of gold. This would favor farmers and debtors. It would make it easier for them to pay off debt. And this is embraced by this guy, William Jennings Bryan, who runs for president three times and loses all three times just like my boy, Henry Clay. He won the Democratic nomination in 1896, and he's being carried away here at the convention of 1896. He is a great orator, and he challenged McKinley for the election. He ends up losing the election of 1896. But he gives a very famous speech at the Democratic convention called a cross of gold. Absolutely be able to recognize the cross of gold, and this is favoring farmers in the in the 16 to 1 silver ratio. He said, we will answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Absolutely no cross of gold. It's favoring the introduction of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1, and this would be favored by farmers and poor individuals, especially those out west. All right, we're going to the progressive era now, and we'll talk about who the progressives are. So we're really at the turn of the 20th century now, early 1900s. Progressives were most likely to be women, members of the middle class, and people that lived in urban areas. And they wanted to find solutions to the problems of society. Now, not all progressives agreed on everything, but for the most part, they believed that humans had the ability to solve problems of society. So some progress progressives also carried ideas over from the populist era or in the farmers what we just talked about again the direct election of senators favoring rail railroad regulation the secret or australian ballot and income tax as well can't talk about progressives well i'll talk about muckrakers these are journalists that ex that wanted to expose scandal corruption and societal ills and they benefited from mass circulation of newspapers their messages really got out because people were reading lots of newspapers so who are some of these famous journalists and famous muckrakers that you should know definitely know upton sinclair he wrote the book the jungle i'm sure you all have at least heard of this before if not personally read it and this helps inspire two acts of pure food and drug act and the meat inspection act both of 1900 six jacob reese absolutely know this guy he is a danish immigrant and he published the book how the other half lives and he went around new york city taking photographs that exposed poor living conditions for immigrants in new york city definitely know jacob reese lincoln steffens wrote a book the shame of cities which portrayed the corruption between municipal or city governments and businesses. Ida Tarbell, you look at the word tar, you should think oil. She wrote a book about the harsh treatment of other businesses by the Standard Oil Company, which was by Rockefeller. Her father actually was put out of business due to 
John Rockefeller Standard Oil Company. Frank Norris wrote the book The Octopus, which is about railroad corruption. And some two and two other important progressives that you should know, they weren't necessarily they were not authors, but they had a huge impact on this movement. Robert La Follette, he was the governor and senator from Wisconsin, not at the same time, but he was both. He brought to Wisconsin the direct primary, which allowed individuals of Wisconsin to have votes in party pol- in party primaries. The initiative, which again is allowing citizens of Wisconsin to propose laws. The referendum is having citizens of Wisconsin vote on laws and recall, which is removing government officials from office. These are all state reforms and it increases the power of individuals in that state. Definitely know that the purpose is to give power back to individuals. Jane Adams, holy cow, can't talk about her without talking about this building, the whole house in Chicago. She was the founder of this, and the purpose of this was to aid women, children, and immigrants and help them adjust to American society. African Americans, for the most part, were left out of government reforms during the progressive era. You should definitely be familiar with this guy, W.E.B. Du Bois. He demanded an immediate end to segregation. He was the first African-American to get his Ph.D. from Harvard as well. So he's pretty much a genius. And he helped form the NAACP, or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is still around today and was was grown out of the Niagara Movement from Niagara Falls, Canada. Ida B. Wells Barnett, or Ida B. Wells, was against lynching. She was an anti-lynching advocate. Holy cow, no her. She is frequently tested on the exam. Be able to recognize that she was an outspoken journalist and wanted to end lynching. Progressive amendments that you should know, there's quite a few. The 16th Amendment is the graduate income tax. Again, this idea the more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. The 17th Amendment is the direct election of senators. So now individuals of states will vote for senators rather than the state legislatures. The 18th Amendment is prohibition or ending alcohol, and this was influenced by the WCTU, or the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the temperance movement, which was really around since pre-Civil War as well. The 19th Amendment is women's suffrage, and that is heavily influenced by women like Alice Paul, and also drew on inspiration from the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention in New York. The social gospel, not to be confused with the gospel of wealth, the social gospel is this idea that Protestant churches should be used to help aid the poor. When we're talking about the progressive area, definitely know Theodore Roosevelt. He proposed the Square Deal, which focused on conservation, regulation of trust, and he wanted to regulate between good and bad. He wasn't all he wasn't against all types of trust, just against bad types of trusts. He was also in favor of consumer protection. And you saw that in the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. And he really was instrumental in passing that after he read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. He also helped settle a dispute between a between workers and an employer at the anthracite coal mine labor dispute. And he basically told the owners, if you don't come to the work, come back to the table to negotiate, I will take over the mine. So he played, he is one of the few presidents that did not automatically side against workers in a strike. Woodrow Wilson became president in 1912 and he campaigned on something known as new freedom and he wanted to eliminate all types of trusts. He didn't care if they were good or bad. If they were trusts, he wanted to get rid of them. He also favored lowering tariffs. You should know that because Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat and Democrats want to see tariff rates go down. And this tariff rate was the Underwood tariff. And you also see the Federal Reserve Act created during his administration as well, as well as The income taxes, 16th Amendment, occurs on his watch. Important progressive acts that you should be familiar with. The Hepburn Act is passed to regulate the railroad industry. This really gives more strength to the ICC. And the Clayton Antitrust Act strengthens the Sherman Antitrust Act. And now labor unions are exempt from prosecution. So with the Clayton Antitrust Act, labor unions could not be broken up due to the Sherman Antitrust Act. All right, we're going to go over to imperialism up to and including World War I. The Spanish-American War, this is a really big turning point in U.S. foreign policy, and this has been a past essay question on how this could be considered a turning point. So in 1898, with the Spanish-American War, and the causes um, are many, including this guy, Alfred T. Mahan. He writes a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And his thesis, his argument is that 
strong countries must have strong navies. And this influences people like Theodore Roosevelt to encourage the United States to build up its navy. Yellow journalism is a huge cause of this. And this is exaggeration of stories to sell newspapers. And two journalists that you should be familiar with are Hearst and Pulitzer. The USS Maine is a U.S. ship that was sent down to Cuba to kind of offer some protection if needed. And it was stationed at Havana, Cuba, and it mysteriously blew up. And many people were unaware of who did it. Many people blamed the Spanish because the U.S. and Spain had some beef at that time. And Hearst and Pulitzer heard about this, and they just went crazy. And with, through yellow journalism, many Americans came to believe that the Maine was blown up purposely by the Spanish. So this helps propel the U.S. into war. What also does is the DeLome letter, which was written by a Spanish minister, and it trash-talked McKinley, called him weak, basically, and said he was catering to the rabble. So basically, Spain saying, McKinley, you're a chump. And um, yellow journalism, again, is a major cause. And ultimately, all these reasons lead to the American people or American public demanding war. So why was the U.S. imperializing in the... And they win this war in a, in a short time, only four months. So why does the U.S. begin this policy of imperializing? Well, like all countries, there's a need for raw materials and they wanted money for businesses. They wanted more markets. There were many in the United States who were against imperialism and some major and some influential people formed the Anti-Imperialist League. They were Some members were Mark Twain, presidents of Harvard and Stanford. Samuel Gompers and Carnegie as well, they were against imperialism and thought the U.S. should not follow an imperialistic policy. And many of them looked at the, the Philippines, which the U.S. gained as a result of the Spanish-American War, and the U.S. did not grant the Philippines independence, and said, don't these Filipinos deserve the consent of the governed and this whole idea of you know, all these freedoms that we in the United States have, that was the argument against imperialism. Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, holy cow, know this bad boy. This states that the U.S. could intervene in the affairs of Latin America. The Monroe Doctrine said to European countries, hey, stay out of Latin America. And the Roosevelt corollary said, not only are you to stay out of Latin America, but the United States can get involved in Latin America. And this increases U.S. presence in Latin America and the U.S. becomes a police power. Definitely be able to recognize that. Dollar diplomacy is an idea, is a policy that happens under President Taft and U.S. businesses were encouraged to invest in Latin America. So this is an economic policy encouraging investment in Latin American countries. This is concerned with economic interests. World War I happened, starts in 1914 and goes till 1918, but the U.S. doesn't get involved until 1917. So why does the United States get involved? Well, we have unrestricted submarine warfare, and here is a ship, the Sussex, that was blown up, or the Suse, if you are Francais, that was blown up by the Germans in their use of unrestricted submarine warfare. And you also have the Zimmerman note, which was written by a German ambassador to Mexico, telling Mexico, if you attack the United States, we'll make sure you get some of that land back that you lost in the Mexican-American War. This encouraged many Americans to want to go to war with Germany. The real big focus, if there is going to be one on your AP exam, is on the home front during World War I. So how was the war paid for? Definitely no income taxes with the newly adopted 16th Amendment, and also no liberty bonds, that people would buy bonds from the government, basically loaning the government money, and the government pays the bonds back in the future. The Committee on Public Information, holy cow, know this. This is led by George Creel. This has been asked on several released AP exams. The purpose of this was to gain support for the war. So this was an organization that made up of journalists and four-minute men, they were called, because they would give four-minute speeches encouraging Americans to support the war. So definitely recognize the Committee of Public Information helped promote World War I, and George Creel was the leader of this. Woodrow Wilson was president during World War I, and at the end, he had this idea. He, he had 14 points, which were 14 ideas of how the world should be after World War I. And he, his vision was an association of nations, which became known as the League of Nations. And ultimately, the United States does not join the League of Nations because Congress is concerned about the United States giving up some of its war-making powers. And also, the U.S. would be involved in foreign affairs, which is something that the U.S. traditionally had not been involved in. And Wilson promoted self-determination for countries after World War I. So he, he believed that many countries should give up their imperialistic ambitions. And again, ultimately, the United States never joined the League of Nations. And be able to recognize Henry Cabot Lodge, he was a senator that actively 
protested the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, we're going to jump ahead to the Roaring Twenties, and we're going to talk about politics in the Roaring Twenties. And the first president elected in 1920 is Warren G. Harding, and he campaigns on something known as a return to normalcy. So this is trying to go back to the way things, quote unquote, used to be before the Progressive Era, before World War One. He is associated with scandals, just like President Grant was, and the one that he's associated with is the Teapot Dome scandal, and this is when his Secretary of Interior, Robert Fall, leased some oil land to a company, and he was essentially paid bribes in order to lease this land. This comes out shortly after Warren G. Harding dies. Now, his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, takes over, and he believed, he had a very strong laissez-faire approach to the economy, that the government should not really get involved in the economy. The guy you should definitely recognized through this is Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon. He was Secretary of Treasury throughout the 1920s, and he believed in tax cuts for the wealthy, in this idea of supply-side economics, or what becomes known as Reaganomics in the 1980s. Tax cuts for the wealthy, and this idea is that if the wealthy pay, pay less taxes, that money will trickle down and help invigorate the economy. Nativism is huge in the 1920s. Again, nativism is this fear, distrust, hatred of foreigners, and we see it in two different immigration acts. The first one is the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, which limited immigration quotas to 3% of a country's population in 1910. So if there were 100 people from Germany living in the U.S. in 1910, that means that only three people from Germany could come to the U.S. in 1921. And here's a very famous political cartoon. All these individuals are trying to come from Europe, but only 3% of them could come in. Three years later, we have the National Origins Act, which limits the immigration quota to 2%. So it goes from 3% to 2%, and instead of using the 1910 census, the U.S. will use the 1890 census, and this is used to really hurt those new immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. Both of these acts say, signal an end to unrestricted immigration in the United States history. Really up until this point, immigrants, at least from Europe, were able to come in as much as they wanted. From here forward, we begin to see restricted immigration. The KKK becomes very popular during the 1920s again. This time they also focus on discriminating against Jews and Catholics. And one of the reasons why it becomes popular is a movie called Birth of a Nation, which glorified the KKK. Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants that were convicted of murder, and they were sentenced to death and were executed in 1927. This is an example of nativism because many individuals feel they did not get a fair trial. They were on trial for murder, but most of the murder case actually focused on who they were and what their thoughts were, this idea that they were atheists, that they were anarchists, and they were draft dodgers, and they were immigrants. It wasn't so much about whether or not they committed the murder, but rather their character was on trial. Women in the 1920s definitely know this idea of flappers, this image of a new woman with shorter hair, and women who would drink and smoke and, and dress in shorter dresses and, and would work. So you see this new the birth of a new woman. Women's suffrage happens in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. And Margaret Sanger, definitely be able to re recognize Margaret Sanger. Here she is. She advocated birth control. She was a very outspoken advocate for birth control. The Harlem Renaissance, can't talk about the 1920s without talking about the Harlem Re Renaissance. This is a celebration of African-American culture and music. And definitely know the two poets and writers, Claude McKay and Langston Hughes. If you ever see their names on a multiple choice question, I can guarantee you the answer will be the Harlem Renaissance. So definitely know Claude McKay and Langston Hughes. All right, we're going to jump ahead to the 1920s to talk about the Great Depression and the New Deal. President Hoover is president during the Great Depression, and his response to the Great Depression was continuing this laissez-faire approach and favoring little government action, and he really relied on volunteerism, this idea that individuals and charities could help solve a lot of these problems. He urged businesses to keep wages and production at status quo. So not to cut back on wages. FDR, we're going to jump ahead to when he becomes president and his New Deal program. He has several different acts that are passed, and these are called the Alphabet Soup Program or the Alphabet Soup Agencies. Definitely know the CCC is the Civilian Conservation Corps, and this put young men 18 to 24 to work. And they worked on environmental work such as planting trees, building parks 
parks, etc. So if you ever see a picture of young men outdoors working, chances are it's the CCC and it deals with the Great Depression or New Deal era. Chances are it is the CCC. The Tennessee Valley Authority is the building of dams that help provide jobs and hydroelectric power in the Tennessee Valley region and this inspired other dams throughout the country. The AAA or the Agricultural Adjustment Act paid farmers not to grow crops because farmers were overproducing throughout the 1920s. The Supreme Court later declared this unconstitutional in Butler v. U.S. That's important to know, and we'll get to that in a second. The National Industrial Recovery Act is created, and this allows the president to set codes for industries. And codes are prices, working hours, etc. And Section 7A of the NIRA allowed unions to collectively bargain. And this is the whole NIRA is declared unconstitutional in Schechter Poultry v. the United States. And I do have a video on not only the New Deal in these different programs, but also these two Supreme Court cases. And it's important to note that these two Supreme Court cases declared these New Deal programs unconstitutional because this leads FDR to issue what becomes known as the court packing plan. He did not agree with the judge's decisions and you he wanted to be able to appoint more judges. Because there were several judges that were older, he proposed a plan that for every judge over 70 that does not retire, he could appoint a new judge. This would allow him to appoint up to six new judges. So the Supreme Court under this plan could go from nine individuals up to 15. This is a huge disaster for FDR. The American public hates it. Congress hates it, including his own political party, the Democrats. Some Two, two, a couple key people you should associate with the Great Depression include Huey Long. He was a senator from Louisiana. He proposed to, to provide $5,000 to every family by taxing the wealthy. Dr. Francis Townsend was an elderly doctor who favored giving $200 per month to senior citizens. This was instrumental in the development of Social Security. John Maynard Keynes was an econo economist, and he influenced FDR. And he believed that the government should run a deficit to improve the economy. So the government should purposely spend more money than it brings in in order to improve the economy. This is known as Keynesian economics or deficit spending. World War II, lots of things that lead up to World War II you should be familiar with, including the Neutrality Acts of 1935 to 1937, which forbade trade with belligerent or warring countries. And it did not matter who was the aggressor or who was the victim. The U.S. could not tra trade any war materials with either person. And the U.S. citizens also could not travel on ships from warring nations. This was different than World War I when the U.S. did not forbid that. The Neutrality Acts of 1939 allows the U.S. to sell weapons to democracies via a cash and carry basis, meaning the country must pay full price for them up front and then pick up the weapons themselves. Two groups begin to appear in the late 1930s, early 1940s that express this idea of isolationist versus interventionist. The Committee to Defend America were interventionists. They favor providing lots of aid to European countries. And the American First Committee was a group of isolationists. And a prominent member is Charles Lindbergh. And you can see Charles Lindbergh giving a speech to a crowd here. And just over his left shoulder is a picture of George Washington and this idea that the U.S. should remain isolated or neutral. The Lend-Lease Act of 1941 allowed the U.S. to lend crucial supplies to countries the president deemed vital. This was aimed mostly at Britain, and they could lend them to them. It did not have to pay full price for them like the cash and carry policy. Jumping ahead to the end of World War II, why did Harry Truman drop the atomic bomb? And the first atomic bomb was dropped by this playing the Enola Gay. If you see a multiple choice question, the answer is to save American lives. In some way, shape, or form, it's to cut down on the amount of Americans that would be killed in an invasion of Japan. Women in World War II can't talk about women without talking about Rosie the Riveter, this idea that women would work in factories, and this was portrayed. Rosie the Riveter was portrayed in different films and magazines as well. Millions of women took took jobs in factories and the incomes increased. However, when the men returned from the war, they were expected to give up their jobs. Japanese Americans were extremely affected by World War II. Executive Order 9066 was issued by FDR and this called for the Japanese internment camps and 100 plus thousand Japanese Americans were moved from the West Coast to camps in the Midwest and this was upheld in the Supreme Court case Korematsu versus the United States. Mexicans increased drastically 
prior to and during World War II with the Bracero program, which encouraged Mexican immigrants to come to the United States to work. And an example of tensions in the United States during World War II between Mexicans and Americans is the Zoot Suit Riots. And this happened in L.A., California. And if you look at these Zoot Suits, you can see that there's lots of cloth that is used on them, and these are very big suits. People were encouraged to ration all types of goods during World War II, including cloth. And many young Mexican Americans would wear these zoot suits and they ended up clashing with the US Marines on in Los Angeles who resented the fact that they were not rationing. And this is an example of conflict between sailors and Marines and Mexican Americans during the war. African Americans, the important thing to know about African Americans is this double V campaign. Many African Americans signed up for World War II as a way to not only def defeat fascism abroad, which is victory abroad over fascism, but they also hope to gain more rights after the war here at home. So the double V campaign stands for victory abroad over fascism and victory at home over racism. Let's get into the Cold War. The Cold War, one of the most influential people from the 1940s is this guy, George Kennan. He is the author of something known as the Long Telegram, and he is the father of containment. And his idea was to keep communism from spreading. Wherever communism is, the U.S. should make sure that it does not grow from that point. So what is the impact of Kennan and his ideas? Well, he helped end the U.S. policy of isolation. So really, in, after World War II, you see this idea that the U.S. remaining isolated is, is no longer true. An example of containment is the Truman Doctrine, which when Truman request, requested and received $400 million for military and economic aid to Greece and Turkey. There was this fear Great Britain was no longer able to provide aid to Greece and Turkey, and there was this fear that those two countries could fall to communism. So Harry Truman asked for money and did receive from Congress money to give to Greece and Turkey, and they did not fall to communism. Another example of containment is the Marshall Plan. And Secretary of State George Marshall instituted this policy that the U.S. would spend billions of dollars over the next several years to improve European economic recovery. So he favored giving money to Europe in the hopes of improving their economies and making communism less appealing. In 1949, while Harry Truman is president, we have the fall of China, and Mao Zedong becomes the leader of China, and China becomes communist. So the largest populated country in the world at the time becomes communist, and Truman gets blamed for this pretty badly. Domestically, in the 1940s and 50s, we have the Second Red Scare, and one of the things you should be familiar with is HUAC, or the House of Committee of Un-American Activities. And the prominent member of this was Richard Nixon. It's definitely important to know Joseph McCarthy is not a part of HUAC. He is a senator, so he could not be on this House committee. And what the House committee did, what HUAC did, was call before this committee people to testify about their communist ties, including this guy, Alger Hiss, who was a one-time aide to FDR, and he was accused of sharing 65 classified documents and was, was ended up getting sent to jail for perjury. The Hollywood 10 were 10 screenwriters from Hollywood, believe it or not, that refused to testify before HUAC, and they were sentenced to jail for the refusal to testify. McCarthyism is popular in the early 1950s, and Joseph McCarthy, the senator from Wisconsin, accused State Department officials of being communists. He basically accused everybody and their mother of being communists. And the downfall, his downfall really happened when he attacked the army on national TV and many people saw him pretty much as a bully. The Rosenbergs were a, were a husband and wife combo who were convicted of giving A-bomb secrets to the Soviets and they were put to death. Eisenhower's administration during the Cold War, we have Secretary of State John Foster Dulles who advocated this idea known as massive retaliation, that if the U.S. were to get into conflict with the Soviet Union, they would not hesitate to use nuclear weapons. This promoted this idea of brinkmanship, the, the idea that the U.S. and the Soviet Union was always on the brink of war. In contrast, JFK, when well, we'll talk about him in just a minute, he had a policy known as flexible response. And this used more covert action like the CIA, more secret, smaller scale stuff, rather than the big military, these huge super bombers that Eisenhower advocated building up. Sputnik in 1957 is a satellite that is launched by the Soviet Union. And the impact of this is the U.S. increases its spending on science and education. Definitely know that. The U-2 spy plane is one of the last things that happens on Eisenhower watch is a U.S. plane that was shot down by the Soviets, and this leads to increased tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. Let's go to JFK's administration. We have the Bay of Pigs invasion, which is located right here in Cuba, and Cuba is 90 miles off the 
coast of Florida. Now, Cuba and Cuba was taken over by Fidel Castro on January 1st, 1959. And the U.S. did not like Castro being in power. So in April of 1961, the invasion takes place by Cuban exiles. And the U.S. does not get directly involved, but the invasion is a huge failure. And it's revealed that the U.S. really encouraged this in, in, invasion. And the impact of this is that Cuba and the Soviet Union worry about future invasions. The next year, in, in October of 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. On October 14th, the US, U.S. surveillance discovers missiles with nuclear capabilities in Cuba. And JFK and Robert McNamara, his Secretary of Defense, and all these people are sitting around this table figuring out what the heck are they going to do about these missiles. And they could destroy most of the United States. So JFK issues a quarantine of Cuba, not allowing any ships to come in. And eventually the Soviet Union withdrew its missiles, and the U.S. promised not to attack Cuba, and the U.S. would, would withdraw their missiles from Turkey. So this is the closest that the two sides ever came to nuclear war. All right, civil rights, we're going to cover three decades here, the 1940s and 1960s. Definitely no executive order 9981, which was issued by Harry Truman, and this desegregated the U.S. military. This is after World War II, and the U.S. military is desegregated. A. Philip Randolph was a union leader and a civil rights advocate, and during World War II, he told FDR that he wanted to have this march on Washington if the United States would not and discrimination. And this led to FDR banning segregation in defense industries. He issues his own executive order outlawing segregation in defense industries. Jumping ahead to the 1950s, we have Brown versus the Board of Education, which reversed Plessy versus Ferguson. And it said that states states must desegregate schools with all deliberate speed. Three years later, we have the Little Rock Nine in 1957. And Eisenhower sent federal troops to allow students to attend Little Rock High School. In 1955, we had the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which was started by Rosa Parks here. And in the background, you see Martin Luther King Jr., young Martin Luther King, at 26 years old. They were successful in ending segregation on buses. And Martin Luther King drew on ideas from Jesus, Thoreau, and Gandhi. And one year after Rosa Parks was arrested, Montgomery buses were desegregated. Let's go to the 1960s. Lots of stuff happens in the 1960s with civil rights. In Greensboro, North Carolina, there is a sit-in in which four young African Americans sit at an all-white counter hoping to desegregate those counters. Martin Luther King focused on Birmingham where he is arrested for protesting. And he writes his very famous writing, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And he drew on Thoreau's and Gandhi's ideas of civil disobedience. And he wrote in this letter, an individual who breaks a law, the conscience tells him is is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. So he's saying it's actually a good thing to break a law that is wrong. Alabama and Old Miss were attempts to keep colleges from desegregating. You have George Wallace in Alabama. In Old Miss, you have James Meredith, a 28-year-old African-American Air Force veteran who wanted to go to school there. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed into law by then-President Lyndon B. Johnson, which guaranteed equal access to public accommodations. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 is passed a year later, which eliminated literacy tests for voting. And the number of African-Americans registered to vote in the South skyrocketed as a result. The 24th Amendment, which isn't on here, that eliminated poll taxes from for requirements for voting. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, pronounced SNCC, was a group that helped register blacks to vote in Mississippi, where only 5% of African Americans were registered in 1964. Later on, under the leadership of a gentleman by the name of Stokely Carmichael, SNCC began to focus on black power. And the Black Panthers in 1966 were founded by two individuals, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and they advocated the arming of blacks against white police. All right, we're going to jump back to the 1950s and talk about the Interstate Highway Act under Eisenhower. This is the largest, pu largest public works project to date in history. It created 42,000 miles of highways. And chances are, if you've driven anywhere in the United States long distance, you've been on one of these highways that were created during that time. And this also could be used for evacuation in case of nuclear war. And this helps spur the growth of 
suburbs. And when we're talking about suburbs, can't talk about it without talking about Levittown. And here's a picture of Levittown. These were cookie cutter houses in suburban Long Island, and they were duplicated in many other cities. And sadly, in Levittown and many other suburbs, African Americans could not purchase houses. And this leads to this idea of white flight, or whites moving from the cities to the suburbs. And again, African Americans were excluded from this. Middle class families in the 1950s, many married women did not work. Um, and this was seen in television shows such as Leave It to Beaver. So there's this idea that women should remain at home, cook and clean and raise children. And this is the idea of the cult of domesticity, that there are separate spheres for men and women in America. Women were expected to stay home and raise a family. In the 1950s, we see a huge rise in consumerism and consumer credit increased drastically in the 1950s. People are buying things on credit cards and in store credit as well. You also see car manufacturers producing newer, more stylish cars every single year, and new appliances were bought in large numbers, including dishwashers, garbage disposals, and TVs. The 1960s, going back to JFK, we have the New Frontier, which focused on urban renewal. LBJ's Great Society is kind of a continuation of the urban of the New Frontier and also of the New Deal. And this was a and there was a huge focus on civil rights and the elimination of poverty. And what we'll see is that the Vietnam War and the Great Society competed for money against each other and often siphoned funds from each other. In 1968, LBJ is not running for re-election, but we have Nixon former vice president under Eisenhower and HUAC committee leader Richard Nixon run against Hubert Humphrey and an independent George Wallace. Now, George Wallace was a Democrat, but he runs on an independent party, and he is able to take away votes from Hubert Humphrey in the South, and Nixon became president. So Wallace and Humphrey are kind of competing for the same group of voters that would traditionally vote Democratic. Two important books from the 1960s that you should know. The first one is Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson. Absolutely know these two books, guys. This depicted the harmful effects of pesticides on the environment, and The Feminine Mystique was written by this woman, Betty Friedan, and this brought attention to challenges that women face, and she challenged this idea of the cults of domesticity and said that most women were not happy living at home, that they really kind of lived these unfulfilled lives just staying at home, that there was more for women to do than just be at home. And this helped increase enrollment in the women's rights movement of the 1960s. And Betty Friedan is one of the founding members of NOW, or the National Organization of Women. In 1968, this is known as the Year of Shocks. We have the assassinations of both Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. The Tet Offensive was a North Vietnamese attack on South Vietnam on this Vietnamese holiday, and many in the United States began to protest the Vietnam War heavily after this. In 1969, we have the moon landing and Wood, the Woodstock concert, which was an example of hippie or a counterculture movement. And the Stonewall riots also occur in 1969. And this happens in New York City in a, a gay bar, the Stonewall Inn, was raided by police officers and many of the patrons were arrested and this riot breaks out and this is really associated with the start of the gay rights movement. Definitely be able to recognize the Stonewall riots. All right, if you're talking about the Vietnam War, and lots of times this has been multiple choice questions, um, it, the Vietnam War, the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War really begins in 1954 with the fall of Dien Bien Phu. That's when the French leave Vietnam, and the U.S. is concerned that Vietnam could become communist, so they increase their presence. In 1964, we have the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. So some background info. The U.S. alleged that American ships were attacked by North Vietnam, and there are some different accounts of what happened. The general consensus is that this was greatly exaggerated or, worst case scenario, even made up. But what does the resolution do? Well, Congress passes a resolution in re response to this incident in the Gulf of Tonkin. And this allowed President Johnson to do anything necessary to prevent future attacks. This essentially leads to a huge escalation of the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Tet Offensive, I just talked about in 1968, public opinion begins to decrease after this. In 1970, Richard Nixon is president, and he orders the bombing of Cambodia. And Cambodia is located next to Vietnam. And and Nixon stated that Cambodia was instrumental in providing 
shipping routes for the North Vietnamese, so he ordered the bombing of a neighbor of neighboring neutral Cambodia. And this leads directly to the Kent State protests and many other protests throughout the United States. Students were protesting the Cambodia bombings at Kent State, and um, they clashed with the National Guard, and four students and many more were killed in the process. And you absolutely positively have to know the Kent State protests were a result of the bombing of Cambodia. Vietnamization is Richard Nixon's policy to to help end the Vietnam War, and this was his plan to gradually withdraw, U, withdraw U.S. troops from Vietnam and replace them with trained so South Vietnamese troops. The War Powers Act of 1973 essentially overturned the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and this limits the, po the president's involvement in war, so it limits his ability to have troops and overseas and prolong, over prolonged periods of time, and he must inform Congress before war actions are taken. Some effects of the Vietnam War that you should be familiar with is that money that could have been used on the Great Society went to Vietnam instead, and this leads to high inflation throughout the 1970s. So the Warren Court is, when we're talking about the Warren Court, this is led by Chief Justice Earl Warren from 1953 to 1969. Most of the decisions of the Warren Court affected the rights of criminals and the accused, as well as religion, civil rights, and women. We already talked about, about Brown versus Board, which happened under the Warren Court. Now we're going to talk about some court cases that you should be able to identify. Map versus Ohio deals with the issue of search warrants and search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Gideon versus Wainwright states that you have the right to a lawyer even if you can't afford one. Escobedo versus Illinois allows individuals to have a right to the lawyer to a lawyer from the time of an arrest. If you're arrested and you ask for your lawyer, you have to be able to see your lawyer. Miranda versus Arizona. I'm sure you're familiar with the Miranda rights, especially if you've seen the movie 21 Jump Street. Um, this is the right for an individual to remain silent, not have to answer police questions. Angle versus Vital say that school-sanctioned prayer is unconstitutional. It doesn't say you can't pray in school, but rather it says that public schools are not allowed to force individuals to take place to participate in sanctioned prayer. Griswold versus Connecticut stated that birth control is legal and that's a boost for women's rights. Tinker versus Des Moines deals with the deals with the Vietnam War in which students were wearing black armbands to to protest the Vietnam War and they were suspended and the Supreme Court says that you do not need to give up all free speech when you go into school. Nixon was very upset with these court decisions and he appointed judges that he felt would strictly interpret the Constitution. So he appointed Warren Burger as new Chief Justice after Earl Warren. And one of the, the major court cases of the 20th century, which was decided by in part by Warren Burger, was Roe versus Wade. In 1973, and this legalized abortion. Bach or Bach, I never know how this is pronounced, versus the Board of Regents stated that giving preferential treatment based solely on race was not allowed for admissions. However, it could be used as a determining factor. So let's go to 1970s and 1980s. We're near the home front. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me. I hope this is helpful. Nixon's administration definitely be able to recognize the silent majority. This was his belief that most people were supportive of the Vietnam War and they just did not protest this. So he would appeal to the silent majority quite often. Henry Kissinger, Kissinger was his national security advisor and then later secretary of state. Under Nixon's administration, we have the bombing of Cambodia, which again leads to the Kent State massacres. In 1971, we have the Pentagon Papers, which detail the U.S.'s involvement in Vietnam, dating back many previous administrations. And this showed deceit by JFK and LBJ administrations regarding the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Nixon, on February 21st, 1972, visits China. And you see him shaking hands with Mao Zedong. This is pretty incredible because he was very anti-communist. And here he is shaking hands with a communist leader. And the U.S. relations with China improved. There are many reasons why he did this. He wanted One of them was to kind of bring the Soviet Union to the bargaining table and hoping to kind of at least give the appearance that the U.S. and Soviet in the U.S. and China had a good relationship and the Soviet Union was concerned. He also wanted to open up Chinese markets to American businesses. So it was about money as well. This visit to China leads to detente, which is improving 
or easing of Cold War tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. You see Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union, on the left, and Richard Nixon on the right. An example of detente is SALT, or the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, and the purpose of that is to limit the amount of nuclear weapons that each country would produce. Can't talk about Nixon without talking about the Watergate complex, and on June 17, 1972, five men from CREEP, or the Committee to Re-elect the President, broke into Democrat headquarters in Watergate, this this hotel and um, condo and office complex. Um, ultimately, it's found out that Nixon was aware of this and he tried to cover it up. And eventually, Nixon resigns due, in part, due to his part in the cover-up. That was a really big issue here, that Nixon was trying to cover up the Watergate break-in. So Ford, Gerald Ford becomes president. And he pardons Nixon upon being president. And he tells America that our national nightmare is now over. And many Americans were upset. And some of them believe that there was a deal between Nixon and Ford. And this hurts Ford's reelection chances in 1976. In 1976, Jimmy Carter becomes president. And he campaigns on being a Washington outsider. This person who's not associated with the Washington, D.C. government and this corruption that has been going on. He, During his administration, you have the Iran hostage crisis, and you also have the Camp David Accords, which is a peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. Definitely know the Camp David Accords. Reagan becomes president in, 19, in the election of 1980, and one of his ideas is the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars. And his idea and this was Reagan's idea for a nuclear defense plan. And this idea was that if the Soviet Union were to launch a nuclear weapon, it would go into outer space and the U.S. would have satellites and lasers up there that would blow up the nuclear missile in outer space. When you're talking about Reagan economically, definitely no supply side economics or Reaganomics. And here he is giving his proposal to America on TV. And again, this is very similar to Andrew Mellon's theory of tax cuts for the wealthy from the 1920s. Definitely know that Ronald Reagan would support Andrew Mellon's tax policies and vice versa, cutting taxes for the rich in the hope that they would spend this money to improve the economy. Reagan also has a huge increase in defense spending, which contributes to um, pretty big economic deficits. The Iran-Contra affair happens, and this is to give you a little background, the American hostages were held in Lebanon, 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 and Contras were rebels that were fighting the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So the Reagan administration sold weapons to Iran, and then that money was then sent to aid the Contras against these left-leaning Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Iran then would help free the U.S. hostages. This was a problem because Congress forbid any any aid to the Contras whatsoever. And this kind of gave Reagan a bit of a black eye for his administration for being involved in this. Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, goes on to be president from 1989 to 1993. And on August 2nd of 1990, Saddam Hussein in Iraq invaded Kuwait. The U.S. and the U.N. and allies use advanced technology to crush Iraq pretty quickly. Saddam withdrew from Kuwait using a scorched earth policy, basically destroying the oil wells and burning everything as they left. And George Bush gave this famous line on national TV saying, by God, we've licked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. So there's this fear for a long time that the U.S. would would get involved in these long, drawn out wars that they would never win. And George H.W. Bush said, by God, you know, we've licked it. It's over. This Vietnam syndrome is over. 1990. Uh, going back, George Bush in 1988 campaigned on a slogan, Read My Lips, No New Taxes. He had to raise taxes to help pay off some debts and help out with the economy. In the election of 1992, you have George Bush as incumbent, and he's running against Bill Clinton and independent Ross Perot. Bill, Clinton, Bill Clinton's campaign had this slogan, It's the economy, stupid, meaning just focus on the economy because the economy wasn't doing so well. In theory, that would help Bill Clinton win, which it does. And the bad economy hurt Bush's re-election bid. Clinton won in the Democrats-controlled Congress until 1994. Clinton's administration from 1993 to 2001, economic issues, definitely know that the internet businesses boomed and the stock market increased drastically during his administration. And the 1990s economy was really unprecedented. Clinton in 1993 signed the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which eliminated tariffs between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And many argued that this would help promote outsourcing or the sending of American jobs to other countries. 
the baby boom generation began to retire in the late 90s, early 2000s. And this leads led to and continues to lead to today to issues with Social Security. And how is this going to be funded? And the grain of America is this idea that we have basically a quarter of the U.S. population is getting really old in the costs associated with them. All right, last slide, some miscellaneous information that you should know. Booker T. Washington was an African-American that favored economic opportunities and vocational training. He gave a very famous speech in 1896 called the Atlanta Compromise, and he said, in all things that are purely social, we could be as separate as the fingers. So he was okay with segregation between blacks and whites, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. So he was okay with segregation, provided that African Americans had equal ec economic opportunities. The Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW, was a labor union that lost influence after World War I. They went on strike a lot and they were nicknamed I Won't Work. African Americans began to vote over, overwhelmingly for Democrats during the Great Depression um, with FDR, and that is a trend that has stayed true even to today. Most African Americans were sharecroppers after the Civil War, in which they would rent land and pay for that land in crops. Great migrations, there are two of them. Each of them happens after a world war and this is the mass movement of african americans to the north after world wars again after world war one and after world war two the bonus army i talked about earlier this is 1932 under president hoover world war one vets demanded an early bonus in 1932 they were promised a bonus later on they wanted it in 1932 because the economy was so bad and this was broken up by the police and army um, on the orders of President Hoover. And this really made him look bad and helped cement that he would not win the election of 1932. Birth of a Nation is a movie in 1915 that was a full-length film that glorified the KKK, and this helped lead to the increase of the KKK in the 1920s. All right, that is everything hopefully you need to know from Reconstruction up to present day. I thank you guys very much for watching this video. I know it's kind of long, but hopefully it is helpful. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. Please help also spread the word. If you know anybody who would benefit from this, anybody in your class, your friends, somebody, please share this with them. Uh, your exam is quickly coming up. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them in time for the exam. I really hope this video and other videos have helped. I appreciate you guys watching all year. It really means a lot. Thank you for watching and have a good day. Hey guys.